What is going on, buddy? My name is Elfrens. Welcome back to yet another reaction. Now, today I got another film very fair to you from guys. If you guys saw the last video, it was kind of spoiled at the end of the last video because the video, last video ended so abruptly that it immediately clicked on this video. But since I have been playing Wally -E as of late, and by the time this video itself comes out, the Let's Play uh, schedule should be completely done and over with. And there was a lot of questions I was always wondering about Wally, -E, and then I stumbled upon this video while I was playing the game. Uh, when I was recording the Let's Play about a week ago. So it got me thinking now several questions that i have always wondered about wally in general like how is he able to survive for 700 years by himself and some of it i've always wondered and always kind of known but i wanted to get more of an in-depth see look into it like we know that wally took apart his bro his brothers that broke down over the years and he just used the parts it's, it's explicitly shown in the movie if you really think about it, he has body parts of his brothers and sisters all over where he lives. <laughs> but I'm wondering how far Matt Pat is going to take this. How far he's going to take this concept. So, with that being said, we're going to be watching Film Theory Wally's Unseen Cannibalism. I'm going to get play on this bad boy in 3, 2, 1. I just noticed an A A113 reference. Go. And my phone is going nuts. Oh man, Cupcake in a Cup is delicious! Wally totally had the right idea with this one. How did they make it taste this good? Let's see, uh, sugar, potassium benzoate. Oh boy. Ugh, gross! I'm not eating potassium benzoate. <laughs> I've never seen this intro. Welcome to Film Theory, the show where ruining your favorite childhood classics is my prime directive. And in my crosshairs today <laughs> is none other than Wally. -E. Now, I could be in the worst of moods, like say hypothetical situation when you have to wait weeks for the darn cable company to fix your stupid internet, when you know the internet is kind of your job, and so you're paying people to just sit around and stare at their computers without actually being able to do anything, and you think that the cable company is going to come back and repay you for all the lost time and effort? No. Meanwhile, the people who watch your videos are like, hey, where's your videos? What are you doing? Matt Pat's slacking off. And you're like, no, it's not my fault. Blame the internet company, but no one cares. No one cares. You know those sorts of moods? Yeah, I could be in one of those purely hypothetical moods just like that, not based on real circumstances. <laughs> but you know what? The magic of Pixar makes it all just fade away. And Wally -E is my all time favorite. You can keep your Incredibles and Nemos. None of them can compete with robots learning to love. And then they watch yep. Hello Dolly, and then they hold hands, and oh. Just getting choked up seeing these clips from the movie. Cut to the next scene, Ronnie. Cut to the next scene. And now they're dancing through space. Oh, I kid you not. I weep openly at three separate points in this movie. Well, at least I did. Now that I'm in the theory game, I don't so much watch movies anymore as I do study them. And this time I rewatched Wally. -E, I wasn't crying because of robot love. I was crying because of the dark secret hidden in the bowels of the Starliner Axiom. To give you yep. a refresher, the Axiom was supposed to be a safe haven for humanity, taking a few laps around the solar system while Wally's -E cleaned up the planet Earth and made it inhabitable once again. But when the events of Wally -E take place, they've actually been gone for centuries, longer than they first did. I asked for this question in my let's play, but what was the end game when the trash was done? Did they have a purpose of how to get rid of it? I mean, look, there are skyscrapers of garbage. There was, they, I don't think the film ever explained that. So Matt, Pat, if you could ever, or if you're probably going to bring it up in this video, can you probably not? Cause I haven't gotten that far yet, but can you try and put together? What was the end game after all the garbage was cleaned up? Like, how are they going to get it? taken care of like it, we see that it's turned into skyscrapers but what how are they able to dispose of it it's a pretty good theory how the how what was what was the original plan going to be intended they mention it in the movie like it's no big deal and uh welcome to day 255,642 aboard the axiom oh hey i see the ship's log is showing that today is our 700th anniversary of our five-year cruise well but that's gonna cause some problems and one in particular what are they eating Cupcake in a cup? 
What even is that? Well, be careful what you ask, because if you connect the dots throughout the movie, you can clearly see what the people on the Axiom are truly eating. And spoiler alert, it ain't Matt Damon's poop potatoes. They're eating each other. That's right, your favorite movie about an adorable little trash robot trying to save the world has covert implications that humanity is so screwed over that people are eating each other. Look, I'm not happy about it either. I wish I be a find that really hard to believe. Discover the true meaning of Christmas, but there's just no evidence. Cannibalism, though? There's a lot of fishy things in this movie that point strongly in that direction. If it's been a minute since you've last seen Wally, -E, two things. First, I just watched it re recently. Before you forever start associating it with the consumption of human flesh. And second, there are a few key plot points that you'll want to keep in mind. Wally -E is set a good way into the future, in the year 2805. But the real action begins in 2105, when the Earth became too polluted to sustain human life. The proposed solution is for a superstore named By and Large to build giant spaceships to evacuate humans for five years while little robots clean up the mess and make Earth great again. Fast forward to the events of the movie, and as I mentioned before, what was supposed to last for five years has now lasted 700. And that leads us to what is a pretty obvious claim at this point, the Axiom has got to be out of food. Trying to stretch five years worth of rations into 700 just ain't gonna work. When I go a week without buying groceries, I'm down to open-faced peanut butter sandwiches and trying to determine if I can drink barbecue sauce for my daily <laughs> recommended calories. Oh boy. And they put extra food on board. I hear you're busy little fingers touching in the comments already, and yeah, I would say that's practically a guarantee as packing extra is standard operating practice for today's space trip. Or maybe they had a... Oh. Okay, there we go. Or maybe they had a section of the ship where they were just... had, like, a farming system. I mean... Got to think about it. For example, NASA, for an average seven-day flight, will have two extra days of food on board with them. But when it comes to the Axiom, we're talking about 140 times the amount of food they would need for the planned five-year excursion. 140 times. Even if, by and large, got wildly ambitious and stocked the Axiom with, say, 10 years of food, an additional two times the planned trip length, people would still start going hungry hundreds of years before the events we see in the movie. Plus, it's not like people are rationing out their meals, unlike Matt Damon on the surface of Mars, everyone is unaware of how much food they have left. So the idea of rationing in order to conserve for the long haul isn't a thing they're worried about. And yet the food keeps coming. But from where? It's also important to note that food is going to be different than other limited resources like fuel or water because there are easy ways for the Axiom to harvest those things for the several centuries where they're in space. In the special feature captaining the Axiom, we learn two important details about the ship. For one, the ship is made out of a nuclear embedded alloy. The Axiom is a second generation General Dynamics Type 3 hull configuration made of a patented nuclear embedded positronium alloy. Which would seem to indicate that it's running on nuclear power. While food supplies will quickly dwindle after a few years, nuclear reactors get a whole lot more bang for the buck. For example, when full I did not know that. one kilogram of uranium-235, popular reaction agent, produces as much energy as 1,500 tons of coal. Jesus. So a small amount of that stuff will cover you for quite a long time. And it's not like uranium is going to turn to mush like a week old avocado. The time it takes for half a sample of uranium-235 to decay is over 700 million years. Jesus! Don't worry about the expiration date on that one. For water, the captaining the Axiom video also informs us that the ship is headed to the Kuiper Belt. And here's your destination, Captain. The Kuiper Belt, that enigmatic frontier of our solar system where fragments of our primordial protoplanetary disk still wait to be explored. This is a part of space that's still, believe it or not, in our own solar system, but is beyond the planets. And all along, we all thought that the solar system ended after your very educated mother just sent you nine pizzas. Take that, sixth grade science class. Film theory be dropping knowledge all over this his house. The Kuiper Belt is filled with frozen asteroid-sized chunks of various substances like methane, ammonia, and you guessed it, water. So it's not going to be hard to imagine that the Axiom could harvest some ice around it. But guess what you won't be finding on rocks floating through the empty void Food. space? Cows, wheat, other random... Okay, this video took an entirely different direction than what I was expecting. Foodstuffs? So fuel and water could technically be taken care of, but you just can't make food appear out of nowhere. Or can you? This is the future, after all, so maybe they've developed a way to create food out of thin air. Or at least that's what I initially thought until I looked a bit closer. I mean, food needs to come from somewhere. And note that we don't see any animals on the ship other than humans. Unlike water, food is more complicated than simply a bunch of hydrogen and oxygen atoms put together. Yeah. So you'd need some ingredients for the food from somewhere. And even if they had developed some meal replacement superfood like Soylent, which delivers all your essential calories, it still requires plants. 
Soy. Not even the ship's captain recognizes what a plan is or how it grows. W where's the thingy? Plan. Plan. Right, right. So what exactly would the hypothetical food be made out of? Also, also, if the Axiom were somehow able to synthesize food out of thin air, why would it be such a big deal that Earth can grow plants again? Wouldn't they be able to stay on the Axiom or go and colonize a new planet with that kind of technology? Nope. Yeah. We definitely run out of food, and yet we see that the population has managed to survive for generations aboard the Axiom. Does that automatically prove that the past are eating other passengers? Well, not by itself, but it does color the way that we look at other issues. Issues like, where do the dead people go? The Axiom has been flying around for 700 years and started with a population of 600,000. Again, according to those DVD special features. The Axiom is a virtual city in space designed to accommodate the needs and desires of each of her 600,000 passengers. During that time, we could be certain that those 600,000 starter people have died several times over. When Captain McCree looks at the pictures of the captains before him, we see that there were five previous captains of the Axiom who've lived and died, and that they were each captain for between 120 and 150 years. That means we're looking Eesh. at lifespans that may be as long as 200 years, but that still leaves us with over 2 million dead bodies that the Axiom's gonna have to deal with. And we know they're not thrown away since we see the airlock system and garbage disposal areas of the ship. When Wally and Eve get pushed into the inner bowels of the Axiom with the rest of the waste, there's no organic material material to be found, only mechanical parts. And when things do get jettisoned out into space, again, there's nothing but trash and metal to be seen. So if you're not throwing the dead bodies away or launching them into space, there's only two possibilities. One, burning them into ash, which is likely, or two, yeah. recycling them. And if you've got a lot of one kind of material that needs to be recycled, i.e. human bodies, and another resource that you're in desperate need of, i.e. food, then it makes at least mathematical sense to see if the surplus of one can fix the deficit of the other. But of course, no human would ever agree to a plan that monstrous, am I right? Well, I am right. But aboard the Axiom, they wouldn't have to. Remember, the Axiom's captain is incompetent. Until his spiritual awakening late in the film, Captain McCree demonstrates that he holds a meaningless title responsible for nothing more than reading announcements and clapping twice to get his coffee. McCree doesn't even know how the controls of the ship work. Otto, why did you wake me for morning announcements? <laughs> Honestly, it's the one thing I get to do on this ship. So it's clear that any I never thought about that. decisions on the ship aren't going through him. Enter Otto the Autopilot, well. who has no problem instituting the system of man eat man. Remember that all of Otto's actions revolve around Directive A113, a program which says that the Axiom must never return to Earth. Autopilot, take control of everything and do not return to Earth. Repeat, do not return to Earth. Let's get the heck out of here. Both of the problems I just mentioned, the Axiom becoming crowded with corpses and running out of food, would very much threaten Directive A113 by requiring a return to Earth to offload or get more supplies, thereby forcing Otto, in an attempt to fulfill his programming, to come up with a solution to fix both problems at any cost. Sir, I insist you give me the plan. Otto, get out of my way. We cannot go home. What are you talking about? Why not? That is classified. Captain, give me the plan. What do you mean classified? You don't keep secrets from the captain. It's not evil, it's just an artificial intelligence following his programming to the letter. And unlike McCree, True. Otto controls pretty much everything happening on the ship because everything on the Axiom is taken care of by the robot fleet. From being lifeguards at the pool, to performing maintenance, to delivering drinks. The passengers have relinquished all the control to the robots. B is for by and large, your very best friend. And many of these robots are obsessed with cleaning and contaminants. Thus, it would only be in their programming to want to dispose of of something as unsanitary as a human cadaver. Huh. Which brings us to the grimmest part of all. Sure, I've demonstrated how the passengers and the Axiom could have come about eating each other, both in terms of necessity and in the logistics of how such a system could come about, but up to this point, it's been mostly speculation. It's time to prove this grim truth using science. Just look at the passengers aboard the ship. I'd say that they're a bit overweight. And that's not me judging them, that's a big point in the movie. The by and large CEO makes the claim that due to the effects of microgravity, you and your passengers may have suffered some slight bone loss. And the diagram on the screen strongly implies that the bone loss is the cause of everyone's bootylicious body. But 
the science of that just doesn't make any sense. Sure, NASA has done a lot of research and determined that the weightlessness of space makes bones less dense very quickly and causes muscles to atrophy, but neither of these cause people to be overweight. And even if it did, what evidence do we really have that these people are subject to microgravity in the first place? Based on the way Wally falls down the trash chute and the way the babies slide down the Lido deck at the end of the movie, the axiom is mimicking Earth's gravity, just like it mimics Earth's temperature. If there were microgravity on board, you wouldn't need a hover chair because literally any chair not bolted to the ground could hover. So all this talk about microgravity causing obesity is pure lies. And while the movie leads us to believe that their physical inactivity is what causes them to gain weight, that also simply isn't true. Inactivity isn't good for you, sure, but weight loss is more tied to what you're consuming rather than what you're burning off. Don't get me wrong, the passengers wouldn't be in good shape, but if they never used their muscles, they'd simply be frail, not fat and overweight. This means that whatever they're eating on a regular basis is densely caloric. That's what's maintaining the kind of weight that we see them toting around in the movie. And as it turns out, human meat could yield those sorts of results. According to a disturbingly specific article in Popular Science, an average human body, when cooked, is good for a little over 80,000 calories. And these were what? bodies analyzed in the 1940s and 50s, long before the American obesity epidemic forced our mayors to decide how big our cups of Mountain Dew could be. So we can imagine that people of today would be even more caloric, perhaps topping 100,000 calories apiece. And calories coming from human flesh aren't exactly healthy calories either. The Popular Science article notes that a significant percentage of those calories in a human body are coming from adipose tissue, pure fat. So combine, say, a fatty, human flesh-filled diet with onboard inactivity, and you've got yourself a recipe that results in some very overweight passengers, like the ones that we see populating the Axiom. Now, of course, there's one final problem to this theory, tricking people into eating other people, getting around that human-y flavor you're gonna be contending with. It's kinda like getting a kid to eat Brussels sprouts. Eat it, it's gonna be good for you. Or, I guess in the Axiom's case, eat it, because if you don't eat your fellow passengers, there's literally nothing else we can serve you, so, uh, you're gonna die and then get fed to everyone else. So how do you season up a human body to make it palatable to a bunch of unaware passengers? Well, the solution is a lot more straightforward than you might initially think. Science has actually proven that one of the best ways to mask the flavor of something is to liquefy it and then serve it through a straw. But it's not like everything that the people on the Axiom consume comes through a straw, I mean... Oh, <laughs> that's it. I got nothing. I just ruined my favorite Pixar movie. Robot romance will never be the same. And with that, Charlton Heston, if you would be so kind to lead us out. Please, these people! We gotta stop them somehow! But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. That went in a direction I was not at all expecting to say the least. I don't really believe it because Otto, following his programming, wouldn't would see that as a more evil thing. I'm, I'm trying to trying to put this together, but my brain is just just not accepting it. <laughs> There's going to be a huge segment in this video in my audio track where it's just not just total silence from me because I'm trying because I'm like trying to piece together what Matt just Matt Pat just said but uh <laughs> what, do, what, what do I what do I what do I say at this point I don't even know what to say I might as well just say the outro because I got nothing nothing I got nothing to say I don't personally believe it but no, no, I refuse to believe it. I'm doing the outro. Please like and subscribe, all that stuff, guys, and I will see you in the next video. What did I just watch? <laughs>